Hey everyone, this is Mike from GMAT Ninja. I'm here to talk to you about something we see a lot of our students doing. Something that seems like a great way to prep for the GMAT, but that actually is really harmful to your score. That something is studying official solutions to quant questions. And if you focus too much on those solutions, you'll miss a huge opportunity for improving your quant reasoning skills. So I want to explain what I mean by that, and then give you some concrete guidelines for making the most of your official guides. First, some context. The GMAT is not a content test. Take the quant section, for example. Fractions, exponents, ratios, quadratics. These are examples of the mathematical content that does in fact appear on the test. For many of us, especially in the US, learning that mathematical stuff often involved drilling a bunch of examples and then studying the steps to solve those problems so that we can mimic those steps later. And because this approach worked so well for many of us in grade school and perhaps in college or university, we've developed a deeply ingrained sense that improvement comes from studying examples and understanding the explanations to problems that gave us trouble. Unfortunately, on the GMAT, this approach isn't very effective. Don't get me wrong, you absolutely need to have a strong foundation rooted in certain mathematical content if you want to do well on the quant section. If you don't know how to do exponents or quadratics, for example, you will be in big trouble. But the quant section isn't simply testing how well you know that stuff. That's because the GMAT is meant to be a reasoning test. Let me show you an example of what I really mean by quantitative reasoning. Here's a GMAT style quant question. I recommend pausing the video and trying this one on your own before we continue. Okay, we need the sum of the reciprocals of the five consecutive even integers starting with 40. So that's 1 over 40 plus 1 over 42 plus 1 over 44 plus 1 over 46 plus 1 over 48. If you're thinking mechanically, you might try adding these together by finding a common denominator or doing some long division, but you'll realize pretty quickly that it would be a nightmare to add these things together using brute force. Instead, let's try to reason our way out of it. Well, each of the five numbers is greater than 1 over 50. So the sum is going to be greater than 5 times 1 over 50, or 5 over 50. And that reduces to 1 over 10, or 0 0.1. Great, we can already eliminate a and b. Now each of the numbers is also less than 1 over 40. So the sum is going to be less than 5 times 1 over 40, or 5 over 40. That reduces to 1 over 8, or 0 0.125. And now we can eliminate choices d and e, and we found the correct choice, C, without breaking much of a sweat. This isn't the only way to solve the problem, but when you're under time pressure, you want your solution path to be as efficient as possible. Now you've probably noticed that the GMAT is really good at disguising content that you know in ways that you've never seen before. You can memorize solutions to 100 different types of exponent problems, but those won't help you on test day when you see the 101st. That's why jumping to the back of the book whenever you see something unfamiliar isn't the best way to prepare. The other problem with focusing on official explanations is that sometimes they're just not that useful. Check out this problem solving question from the 12th edition official guide. Whoever wrote this lengthy explanation thought, oh great, I know how to do this. Let's start multiplying to get rid of those denominators. And of course, that approach will work, eventually, but imagine how long it's going to take you to do all of that messy arithmetic and how easy it would be to make a careless mistake along the way. The official explanation isn't wrong, but it's not the most efficient way to solve this problem. After watching the video, come back to this one and see if you can come up with a better way. If you need a hint, remember that you can't divide by zero. Now here's a data sufficiency problem from the 2020 official guide. Have you ever noticed that the explanation writers always seem to know exactly which numbers to pick? The problem is that we don't. The explanation proves that the answer is C, but it doesn't tell us the best way to tackle this problem from scratch. So what's up with these solutions? Well, it's worth noting that the explanations aren't written by the same people who write the questions, or even by the people who make the test. So the same rigorous thought process that goes into question design isn't being applied to most of the explanations. On top of that, the official explanations often only give you one solution path, which is not necessarily the most efficient solution path. So, studying official solutions isn't a good way to improve your reasoning skills. Instead, 
Use the official guide to practice what you'll be doing on test day, tackling unfamiliar problems and trying to find efficient solutions to them. You want to use the official questions to figure out where you make mistakes and then improve your technique accordingly. I'm going to share a couple guidelines on how to do that. Even though the value of the official explanations is debatable, the official questions themselves are still extremely valuable. Once you've worked through a couple official GMAT guidebooks, you're going to have a tough time finding quality fresh material. There are plenty of unofficial GMAT questions out there, and those can be useful in certain situations, but GMAT spends a ton of money developing each and every GMAT question, and test prep companies simply can't afford to compete. In the words of Marvin Gaye, ain't nothing like the real thing. While working through your official guides, I recommend doing about 30 practice problems at a time. That'll help you develop the endurance you'll need on test day. When you've finished a set, record a list of the questions you got wrong, but resist the urge to study those errors right away. Instead, wait at least a couple days without looking at the ones you missed and then retry them. That'll give you some time to clear your head and come back to those questions fresh. When you do, make sure to read every question twice and take some time to think about how you're going to solve them before you dive in. What you're really practicing is untangling the question, looking for the most efficient solution path, and then checking your work as you go. Even if you get it wrong both times, you've given yourself another chance to strengthen your reasoning muscles. Okay, so what if a question kicks your butt twice? Then what? Well, as you'll hear us say a lot at GMAT Ninja, if a question is giving you that much trouble, it's probably not worth the stress. You can miss a third or more of the quant questions and still get a great score. Missing questions that you can handle is a much bigger problem. So focus on the questions you got right the second time, but not the first time. Retrace your steps and try to figure out where you went wrong. Did you dive down an inefficient solution path without thinking? Did you rush and make careless mistakes? If so, you don't need to learn more math stuff. You need to work on your technique and try to figure out how to avoid those mistakes. And sometimes you will uncover content gaps. If you got questions wrong the first time because you forgot your exponent rules or your special right triangles, you should absolutely go back and review. If you want to get the most out of your official guide, keep your focus on the questions and how you're choosing to solve them. Of course, a good GMAT tutor can help you make the most of your practice. But if you're on your own, I hope I've helped you understand why it's a bad idea to cram quant solutions even if they're official. This is Mike from GMAT Ninja. Thank you for watching.